Thank you, thank you. So, security. Is there another word that brings so much fear and dread to every developer everywhere? <clears throat> if your manager comes up to you and says, hey, someone from security is looking for you, you immediately go, oh no, what have I done? So today, hopefully, we're going to learn how we can avoid that. Uh, first, a little bit about myself. I'm a front-end uh, lead engineer at CareerOS, a company I co-founded. I was born in Romania, but I live in beautiful, sunny Barcelona. Uh, I like to write tech articles uh, and make YouTube videos about accessibility, security, testing, um, anything in between. Uh, like I said, I work um, on all three big frameworks. Um, I've started working with Angular first, back then when it was uh, version 1, then moved on to version 2, Vue, and now I'm um, clearly liking React the most. So before we start, who here has ever been hacked? Or worked at a company that has been hacked or you know, heard about it? It's not a pleasant experience. Uh, but there's no shame in it. In my previous company, we, we were hacked a couple of times. And the first time, it was actually pretty funny. The hackers uh, found an account that had admin privileges. And the first thing they did, instead of stealing user information or stealing promo codes or stealing money, is they changed all the product images to their hacker logo. So it, it blew up all, all over the internet. It was pretty funny. Not for the company. They were super embarrassed. But for us developers, it was um, pretty funny. Now, the next time it, we got hacked, um, they actually did download the entire database and put it online. And then the company realized, hold on, let's, let's start taking security seriously. So what they did is they, they created all of these teams that are in charge of security, like InfoSec, the, um, the department for creating awareness about security, CyberSec, DevSec, and many more teams with Sec at the end um, that I honestly don't know what they do. Because for us, the product engineers, uh, front-end developers who are building features, um, we, we don't actually have anything to do with them. You know, for us, we maybe get a general training once in a while that we click and we ignore. And <laughs> maybe every six months, someone comes back to us and say, hey, you have a ticket with a security vulnerability, fix it. Um, but that's it for us. Like for most front-end engineers, security is something that is very far, far away. We develop a feature, push it to production, and maybe in six months, someone um, creates a ticket for us that something is wrong. And by that time, uh, it might actually be too late. So, and the reason this happens is because we trust, uh, we are a very trustful nature people. So we trust the tools and technology that we use. We trust the frameworks that we use. Um, and we think that, okay, that's enough. Uh, we can trust our feelings. You can trust your coworkers, and you can trust a well-maintained third-party library. But in reality, you shouldn't trust no one, especially unmaintained libraries or third-party uh, packages. One trick I like to do before using a library is to check uh, the issues tabs in GitHub and see how the maintainers respond to comments and how fast they respond. Um, but before we think about it, let's think about uh, one of the most popular examples of a vulnerability, the Death Star. So it took decades to build and run, and now it's gone, destroyed in the single shot in an exhaust port because of a carefully placed backdoor system. So if you allow me, let me explain how we can avoid an another Death Star disaster. I'm going to start with a common, second, uh, common mental model called second order thinking which says that when coming up with a solution, don't focus just on the solution itself, but also on the effects uh, the solution will have across the system. So when you're building a feature or a project, thinking consequences. What are the first order good outcomes and bad outcomes? Let me give you a proper example. For example, you're building, uh, you, you have a checkout page and you realize that um, you're forcing your customers to sign up before ordering. And you notice that some users are not completing the checkout because of this. Now, you might come up with a solution like, let's allow for guest checkout. Here you map the good outcomes. There's an easier checkout for users, and then the bad outcomes. 
Now going forward, forward, what are the side effects of the guest checkouts? You will have obviously fewer accounts, which is something other teams might worry about. Again, here we map out the good outcomes and bad outcomes. Because the biggest problem with a, a working system is actually us, the developers. Because we often think in solution and not in consequences. So to successfully apply second order thinking, we can use a powerful framework called thread modeling into your feature building process. So there are five easy steps to use thread modeling. You gather your team uh, before you groom a story or before you take that story into the sprint, and you, you have five steps. First, you visualize what are you trying to build, and then you identify threats. What can go wrong with this feature or applications that you are building? And here, everyone in the team can be as creative as possible. You just put it on post-it notes and then remove what are realistic and not realistic. Then you, you move to the mitigation factor. What are we going to do to make sure this is not going to happen? And then you validate. You compare your results with your initial goals. Um, but to do thread modeling successfully, everyone in the team must be aware of the most common security risks so you can plan accordingly. Now, I, today I want to focus on just four, uh, which are backdoor products and libraries, cross-site scripting, security logging, and spoofing. So, backdoor products and libraries. I think this is a joke we all seen uh, in the JavaScript world, world that the, fir the heaviest objects in the universe are the sun, neutral star, a black hole, and of course the node modules that um, we used in our projects. So unfortunately, the entry point for node modules, the package JSON, is also the entry point for the most dangerous vulnerabilities out there. So it also might need a sign that says, hey, here be dragons, tread carefully. And why is that? Uh, you usually want to use a popular library or a library that is perfect for the features you are building. And with a simple NPM install, you are opening yourself up to danger. Now, even if the amazing library doesn't have a vulnerability in itself, it may use a package or a dependency or uh, going down the, the, um, the dependency lifecycle that is vulnerable or a direct exploit. Now, thankfully, NPM provides an audit on every package, and it gives you a score of low, medium, or high, depending on uh, which vulnerability it finds. So you can run NPM audit fix or NPM audit fix force to attempt to fix your installed package. Now, I want to stress the word attempt, because in the JavaScript world, you get something like this. You have 20 high security vulnerabilities, you run NPM audit force, and then you have 33 high end. Um, what is also nice is that GitHub has a vulnerability checker called the Pendabot that checks each PR for new updates, and uh, it also creates uh, an automatic PR to bump the version of your vulnerable package. Now, unfortunately, both NPM and the Pendabot catch problems only after that package has been flagged as vulnerable. So by the time you fix it, you may might be a little too late. So there are a couple of best practices. Like I said, uh, check if the library package is well maintained. Uh, do regular checks using NPM audit, maybe include it in your CI-CD pipeline. Install Dependabot, Sneak, or other security audit software to keep your project safe. But importantly is to stay ahead of the game. Uh, check websites, Twitter accounts to see what are the latest vulnerabilities. The most important part is to co practice constant vigilance. So now, let's talk about cross-site scripting, or XSS, which is the, the official term. So uh, XSS has been in the OWASP top 10 every year for the past decade. OWASP is like the the open worldwide application security projects where they talk about, they contain everything about security, like articles, content, top vulnerabilities, and so forth. So XSS is a pretty big deal. So how does it work? An XSS vulnerability happens when an attacker manages to inject malicious code inside your application. This uh, malicious script is then executed by normal user's browser. 
Um, to give a proper example, let's say you have a component form component. And that is rendered inside an article. An attacker would add a comment like this, uh, script alert XSS, something similar. They will run, uh, try to introduce instead of text, the script command. Now this would go on, be saved uh, in, in the database, and then when other users will enter the page, it will render the comments. This will try to be rendered as HTML and run as JavaScript, and this will run inside other users' browsers. Now this is the simplified version. Um, in reality, what hackers actually do is they try to inject an image, and inside the onload or on error methods, they try to introduce um, fetch methods to take all of your information and send it to a third party server, like your cookie data, um, whatever you have in local storage, the worst. So this is pretty scary. You can browse around their website and with an image inserted maliciously, it can take all your cookie and local storage information. So for best practices is to use a sanitized library in the front end, like sanitize HTML. Always validate um, user input on the front end and back end. Do not use VHTML or dangerously set a, uh, inner HTML or inner HTML. This has multiple, in every framework is something with inner HTML. Try not to use it for um, user generated content. Security login. So, um, in today's world, we measure absolutely everything. So page views, clicks, events, errors, how much the user is scrolling, we have heat maps, and all sorts of user-related da data that we can use to determine if what we're building actually works. We, we want feedback and we want as much as possible. So unfortunately, we sometimes might send a little too much information to our third-party vendors that handle this data, like Datadog, Sentry, even Google Analytics. So most common data that we are sending, we are sending uh, reset password tokens or promo codes or checkout generated links. And uh, that means that for every security vulnerability that we're sending, we're storing that information in a database that we don't control. So um, one, one, one reason we are sending this is because uh, we are using querying params in the URL instead of hashes. So we might have a URL like this, yourwebsite.com slash reset password, query token, and a random token. And this um, will be vis visible in the third party um, observability tool. Now, someone may hack that and get this information, but be other situation may arise when people can scan the traffic in an area like here, and if you're visiting this sort of website, they can get that information out of you. So to prevent this, it's recommended to use actually hashes instead of queries, because a, a hash uh, are normally not logged or persisted in observability tools. And most importantly, it's recommended to audit your URLs and pages to make sure you do not show user data on public pages. So for example, you've placed an order, uh, let's say your website.com slash order, and then you have the order ID. You don't want someone having this link, using it, and seeing the order that you placed. Uh, so it's very important to have in place proper control access controls. So use hashes instead of querying params. Make sure you validate control access to per prevent personal data leakage and try to pick and choose which observability that data you're sending. Not just install the, the script SDK and let it do, do its work. Spoofing. Now, phishing and spoofing have gotten very creative over the years. And while both employ similar tactics to achieve the result, which is basically to take the users to another website and steal their information, they do it completely different. So uh, phishing will, t will fake an official email, and in inside the call to action, they will redirect you to another website. Uh, I can't even count the number of fake Jira emails I've received or AWS emails that tell me that I have 
a million dollars to pay AWS and I get scared and I want to click to see what's happening. Uh, so the, the first thing we have to do, of course, is practice constant vigilance. Um, and normally email clients catch this, like Google is pretty small, Gmail is pretty smart to do this. So it, we're going to mark the, um, the email as being uh, probably sketchy. Um, but on the other hand, spoofing, uh, it's, it's going to take advantage of the software that you're building. So what, it's more dangerous because it takes advantage of a, a vulnerability inside your website to redirect your user to another website. So think of a page that um, uh, you can add promo codes. Now, normally when you have promo codes, you have, uh, you're gonna send promotion emails to your clients and say, apply this promo code to get $5 off. You're gonna click that in the email and you're gonna be redirected to the, the official website where the, the code is gonna be already applied. So, how we are doing this as developers, we're probably going to redirect with a query param in the email or an ID in the email, and in, the, in the URL. And when we get to that page, we use location hash, we take that hash, and then uh, we apply the code inside the application. We do this because we want to show the code in a nice way. We have here like apply code UB2335, and this comes from the URL. Now, because um, we can introduce here because we're going to render the HTML due to maybe we want interna internationalization. We might want this text to change depending on the user language. So we have to render HTML there. And because this is user generated content, an attacker could modify the URL to make here in the page something different like this. So now you have apply code and the attacker changed the URL and he inserted and click here link that takes advantage of your website to redirect the user to another page. So you, you, users when clicking it, uh, they will use the URL and share it across platform, maybe make it small using tiny URL so users won't, feel the, won't tell the difference. And they're gonna feel super comfortable being on the Uber website and they might actually click it. So again, the common theme across is to do not render URL or cookie data using HTML parsers, always sanitize the URL data, and practice constant vigilance. Now this warning is given inside the official view documentation, which says that in a nutshell, user provided content can never be considered 100% safe. So to minimize the risk of security vulnerabilities, it's important to follow best practice, like validating user input, using encryption for sensitive data, and implementing proper access controls. So now that we know what the main risks are to our application, we can is easily introduce thread modeling before estimating and grooming a story. And in doing so, we can properly forecast and uh, prevent security uh, issues appearing in our application. Um, the, the, the biggest question that we can ask ourselves when building a feature is, uh, how can attackers hack us? And plan around that. So thank you. If you wanna reach out, um, you can scan this QR code or you can follow me on Twitter, I'm gonna share my slides on Twitter, and you can ask me any questions you might have about our talk. Thank you.